part two. Now the Beam and Joyce were in the last part of the new landing with the floorboards. These are tongue and groove untreated white oak boards and they also have tongue and groove on the ends so you don't have to have the joints over a joist meaning less cuts and wastage. But before I could start putting floorboards down, I had to make sure the joists were spaced out parallel to each other. This is an old trick a lot of you will already know, but for those that don't, visible gaps are the enemy. For example, if you're standing looking down, no matter how perfectly you can scribe the board to this post, you're always going to have a vertical butt joint that's visible. But if you instead cut into the post, you can slide the floorboard under, creating a horizontal joint that's invisible if you're looking down. To fix the floorboards, we used lost head nails. A lot of people on Instagram felt obliged to inform me there are nail guns designed to do this in a split second. But little do they know that this is rural France and you'd spend a day just trying to find somewhere to rent one. It was starting to get pretty late at this point and sometimes you've just got to take a hint to call it a night. 
can see here how the tongue and groove works on the ends. Pretty smart as the joint is supported from all three neighbouring floorboards. These cables are for power sockets underneath the landing, so it needed to be tucked under the floorboards before it was too late. cut these things from some of the original stair treads and we repurpose them to fill in the gaps between joists. The final row of boards were too close to the wall to get nails in, so instead I used this glue, which supposedly sets in five minutes and is only a euro a tube. It's actually given me a whole new appreciation for the power of PVA because it's ridiculously strong, more than capable of holding these boards down, but you do have to put some pressure on them while it sets. Five minutes later. So that was the last floorboard down and all that was left to do was join up the grey render to the landing. And I know some of you won't like to see cement based render on these stone walls, but again it's only a problem where there is persistent water and neither side of this wall is exposed to the elements. But don't worry, the final coat will be red sand and lime. 
it's time to take you all the way back to February, which is actually when we started making the two new flights. That was because if they were already made, it would mean less time between ripping out the old staircase and installing the new one. So the oak we used to frame the landing was green oak, meaning it was freshly cut down and still contained a lot of water, which as it dries will shrink the wood by around 10%, potentially open up gaps around any joints. For finer carpentry such as staircases, visible gaps are the enemy. So the first and most pressing task was to make sure we could actually buy seasoned or dried oak to make stringers long enough to reach between the landings. And for those wondering, this is a stringer, this is a riser, and this is a tread. The three parts of almost every staircase. We needed at least three and a half meters long, and I think these were the four longest ones the yard had. If you want to know how much they cost, I've done a full breakdown of the project on my Patreon, where you can also watch part three right after this, two weeks before it goes live on YouTube with adverts. And thanks to everyone who signed up already, I really hope you enjoyed the series. First of all, I top and tailed them. Then I marked a line trying to maximize the good oak while still cutting out the sapwood. And then it was a case of getting them straight and square using ye old faithful, the Lurum Optal 26, which definitely seems to be acquiring a sort of legendary status on YouTube. For good reason though, it's an indestructible workhorse, but can be a little bit clumsy. After all that, this is what we're left with. Plenty of length and just about enough thickness and width. Next, we moved onto the treads. All of these planks you can see in the back of the workshop were bought a couple of years ago from a local farmer whose oak tree fell down a few years before that. This is the actual Le Boncon advert, which is France's Gumtree Craigslist equivalent. Full pricing is on the Patreon. So there's a big difference between oak you buy from a professional sawmill and the oak you buy from a farmer. Trees that are intended to be cut down for timber are grown in a way that ensures straightness and reduces knots and irregularities. Trees grown in a farmer's field are allowed to twist, bend, split, and generally just become really unruly. 
All of these problems are then magnified if they're not stacked to dry properly, which was probably the case with these. So the end result is boards that look like this. They're just about usable, but need a ton of work to get them into shape. Let's just say that if I ever make another staircase, I know where I'm getting the wood from, and it's not the farmer. <laughs> so how do you make unusable planks usable? Well, the short answer is a lot of patience. First of all, you have to cut out the defects. Checks are cracks across the growth rings, shakes are cracks between the rings. Both are structurally weak and need removing. Sometimes you'll then end up with boards that taper towards one end, which you can then match against a board tapering the other way. Abandon the idea of parallel boards for the time being, you can fix that after they're glued. It's very slow, but because of low waste, this is probably the most efficient method to get the highest volume out of your planks. For cupped boards like this, you can just keep sending them through the surfacer and thicknesser until you've got a board flat like that but you'll remove a lot of material, and we didn't have any thickness to spare. So the alternative is to rip down the center, thereby creating two narrower but flatter boards you can then glue back together. Like I said, patience. Next, you've got to flatten one side. Some of these boards were already so thin that we could only take a couple of mil off the thickness in total. So I kept checking to make sure I didn't get too carried away. Then you run it against the fence to create a 90 degree square edge. Finally, we had to send all the boards through the thicknesser to get that second face flat. 
Ecco. In some cases such as this, we actually had to leave one side of the treads with areas that hadn't even been touched, as this would have made them too thin. These will all be face down so you won't see them and I'm told this was pretty common back in the day. Then I arrange the bores into sets with the best edge at the front of the tread which will be shaped into the nosing. So normally at this point you'd cut the boards parallel on the table saw. But as we'd abandoned parallel edges, instead I used the track saw to get all the edges straight, ready to glue together. And because a lot of weight is going to be bearing down on these treads every day, hopefully, for many decades, instead of a simple butt joint, we tried what's called a spline joint. In hindsight, I think this was unnecessary. Cutting the groove in multiple passes on a table saw like this is actually really difficult. Especially if some of the boards are bowed, it's very hard to keep them flat against the fence, resulting in mishaps like this. Once all the grooves were cut, I used some of the offcuts to make the spline itself. 
So the issue was that the grooves weren't as consistent as they could have been, and therefore the splines weren't as tight as they could be. It's still a very strong joint, but maybe no more so than a butt joint at this level. So it was time wasted, which I didn't really have to spare. Yeah. Two down, only 16 more to go. Before that, however, I'd quickly stood on the board to get a feel for it, but they won't, or at least shouldn't, actually bounce once they're assembled into the flights. And that's because they'll be supported by risers on both the front and the back. It's a lot of wood. We then moved on to the nosing and kept it very simple with this half inch round over. Don't be alarmed here that some of the joints look empty. The splines are just further in as we still have to cut the treads to length. The front of the tread, just behind the nosing, is propped up by a simple housed or dado joint. The back of the tread is slightly more complicated, but before I could do that I had to cut everything to final width. There are loads of online calculators to help with this, but I really wanted to see it in SketchUp before I committed, because these widths would govern everything from here on out. Get the measurements wrong and you'll either not reach the new landing, or you'll be too high when you do. So in theory, 9 horizontal treads at 298 and 10 vertical risers at 175 would get us exactly to the first floor landing. So first I cut the treads, 
and then the risers. And only then could I do the joint at the back of the tread, which was slightly more complicated. It's called a bare-faced housing joint. In the US, it's called a rabbit and dado. And the point of it is so that the riser carries the weight from above. And when you combine both joints, it means that even across a 1.3 meter gap, which is the distance between these stringers, the treads should be fairly rigid and capable of taking a heavy load. First, I routed out two passes with a half inch straight cutter. And then I set up the spindle molder half an inch off the table surface. The final thing to do was cut the treads and risers to length, which was about 1.3 meters. Once we'd filled in any knots and nicks with glue and sawdust, I worked my way up from 40 grit through 80 to 120 sandpaper. Annoyingly, this knot was right on the joint, so I beefed it up with two-part epoxy. Darn it. <laughs> 
and then it was time to glue pairs together. Then I needed to make a lot of wedges, not those kind, but to do that I needed a jig. So using offcuts of the treads and risers and my freshly cut wedges, I was able to trace an outline of what the finished assembly would look like. I then needed to cut out this area from the plywood to create a template I could then use to route out the housing on the stringers. This took a couple of attempts and was extremely frustrating as the template needs to be one point something millimeters greater than what I wanted to route out to account for the extra distance between the guide bush and router bit, unlike a flush bit bearing which copies the template exactly. So after two failed attempts that were too loose, I'd improved my method and was confident this template was going to be on the money. <laughs> 
Thankfully it worked and now you can see how the wedges lock the tread and rise it into the housing. The idea behind this design is so simple but the strength is insane. And once you go deeper and add glue to the equation, there's no chance you'll get it apart again, which I suppose is both a blessing and a curse. So once I knew it fit together snugly, I could then begin routing out the stringers. First I marked a chalk line, an ink line would be more accurate but we don't have one, and then lined that up with marks on my template to make sure both were aligned to each other. Then I was rudely interrupted by this lovely border collie who is actually Rafa's mum, believe it or not. And after a half assed attempt to set up some dust collection, I started rousing. This was the most technically difficult part of the project and I was really happy with how it turned out. Almost no gaps around the nosing and treads. After checking it against where we're going to install the new landing, which I hope you've already seen in part one, it was time to glue up. So some quick maths. It had taken roughly 50 glued joints to get enough treads and risers for each flight, and now there were 58 joints between the treads, risers and stringers, with 36 of those wedges. So in total, each flight had something like 144 joints that all had to fit together. Because once you start gluing, you can't go back. If something went wrong, that would be weeks of work down the drain and we probably would have killed each other.
one. Okay. Yeah, that's good. They say you go to school on the first one, meaning you do things the wrong way, thereby learning the right way. Sometimes you get beginner's luck, and that was certainly the case here. This first glue up went so smoothly that it lulled us into a false sense of security for the second, which went terribly. But more on that later. The final part of this flight assembly was to cut some triangular blocks. It's hard to emphasize just how cold this workshop gets in winter. It's about as airtight as a sieve, and there's obviously no point sticking any sort of heater inside. So when the temperature dropped, we had a problem. The glue we wanted to use wouldn't set below 10 degrees, and with no time to spare, we had to relocate to the kitchen to glue these blocks underneath the treads, which my mum was thrilled about. And that is part two finished. As you know, part three is already live on my Patreon. So if you'd like to get immediate access without ads, then please do check it out. Otherwise, make sure you're subscribed with the bell clicked so you get notified when part three goes public in a couple of weeks. But thanks so much for watching and I hope to see you soon.